ought to say that God is at work in my life. It is a great gift to know that God is at work in our lives. And so Advent is a great opportunity to make concrete or to at least put a fine emphasis on something that often at times may fly under the radar for some. Advent is an opportunity for us to be bathed in the timing of God. All the while, we keep pushing through our time. It's an opportunity for you and I to be fully appreciative that no matter what's happening in my life, in my time, God also has a clock that's ticking right alongside my life. Hmm. And there are moments when God's time breaks into your time. Hello, somebody. You might, anybody ever had an experience where you knew that this was God just kind of kicking the door into my time? Maybe, no, maybe that was just me. Amen. I've, I've had a few experiences where I, I, I realized, man, God, uh, if, 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 if it had not been for you kind of making a, a divine, you know, surprise in my life right now, man, I, 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 I'd kind of, you know, be caught up in the, the vicissitudes and the challenges of my time. But thanks be to God that God has a way of breaking into our time with his time. And that is indeed what we're going to spend our time talking about today. Uh, we're going to talk about divine surprises, the way God breaks into our time. Matthew chapter number 24, we're going to go to verse number 36. And this is Matthew talking to a primarily Jewish audience, an audience bathed in the kind of prophecies, the history of God's revelation, God's covenant relationship with the people of Israel. And it's so important, amen, to just appreciate, you know, I know there's all kind of things going on around Hebrew Israelites and all these different kind of narratives and things. And, and, and I want you to know many things can be true at the same time. It can be true that there were indeed African folks who made up the kind of earliest expressions of the Hebrew people, but it need not require you to erase the other expressions of Jewish existence in the world in order to affirm one. Hello, somebody. I remember I went to Palestine. I'm going on a tangent, praise God, but that's what happens when, you know, the five minutes I was going to spend on communion, I'll just spend on my trip to Palestine. When I remember I went to Palestine, you know, and I was hanging out with some of the Palestinian Christians there, many of whom were, well, there were Palestinian Christians, Muslims, and Jews, all living in East Jerusalem. And some of them, you know, took me to, you know, a couple of sites, and, and, and they were talking, you know, giving me this history, and they said, you know, before uh, the Byzantine and the English Empire came here, we all kind of lived together with some relative peace and harmony. Now, you know, obviously, there were conflicts through the years, but there, were, there was a time where we all kind of got along together. And he took me into his house, and he said, this is my family home. And he said, my family has been living in this same building since the 1500s. And then he took me to a Muslim uh, 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 a, a mosque, a, a holy a, a place of worship. And, and on, the, on, the, on, the, on the outside door, there was the temple... Uh, or there was a, a continent of Africa, and I was like, wow, that's interesting. You got a continent of Africa? He's like, well, actually, right here is where we are right now. And he was talking about the tip of what they call Africa, but there it's called Israel, Palestine, Jerusalem. And what it taught me is that there are times in which all of us need to appreciate that the narratives that are often created in this world are intended to put us in opposition to one another so we forget that we are all God's children. Hello, somebody. You ought to, you ought to just nudge your neighbor, tell him you God's child too, praise God. I, may not, I might not like, you know, everything you do. I might not like who you root for, amen, to win the NBA or NFL, you know, title. I may not like who you vote for, but we are God's children, which means that we have to wrestle 
with what it means to be human in a world that's always trying to divide us from one another. Hello, somebody. And so this letter is being written by the uh, a disciple. His name was Matthew, and he was giving a particular account of the gospel, the life, the ministry of Jesus, knowing that those who are listening to him, who are reading these words, have this kind of question about, is Jesus really the Messiah that was promised across these thousands of years? Because you got to remember the Jewish or the, the, the Jewish folk during this time were living under occupation of the Roman Empire. And so they're waiting for a liberator. They're waiting for a political messiah. They're waiting for the, the freedom that, that allows them to worship their God without a, a, a worry of, of a persecution or to uh, engage in their customs and not have to have the boot of the empire on their neck. They're sitting there waiting for this moment of freedom. And then Matthew was writing to help them see that the Jesus that visited us is the Jesus or the Messiah you've been waiting for. And so here we find in this text uh, the, the, the word of the Lord pulled into this liturgical season of Advent by the global church to help remind us of the coming of God and God's faithfulness to fulfill God's word. And here we pick up the verses in verse number 36. But about that day or hour, no one knows, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son but only the Father. As it was in the days of Noah, so it will be at the coming of the Son of Man. And so again, the significance of Matthew introducing Noah and introducing these figures. Why? Because the readers and the hearers would recognize that, wow, this coming of the Son of Man, this liberatory figure, it fits in the history and the genealogy and the lineage of my own story that has been handed to me. And I want you to know, child of God, that you got a story that's been handed to you. And I, how many of you know Jesus fits good in that story? God fits good in that story from your life, from your culture, from your history. Keep on reading. For in the days before the flood, people were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage up to the day Noah entered the ark. And they knew nothing about what would happen until the flood came and took them all away. That is how it will be at the coming of the Son of Man. Two men will be in the field. One will be taken and the other left. Two women will be grinding with a hand mill. One will be taken and the other left. Whew. That's a tough, it's one of them tough sayings. Therefore, keep watch. Because you do not know on what day your Lord will come. But understand this. If the owner of the house had known at what time of night the bipper or the thief was coming, he would have kept watch and would not have let his house or car be broken into. It's giving y'all a little East Bay remix so we can kind of come, come home to some of y'all. Man, man I, we, I, was at, I was at dinner or lunch with somebody and we were scoping <laughs> Amen on Lakeshore, making sure we weren't going to get bit, praise God. Because we didn't know when they was coming, but we knew they would. Every time a slow, white, tinted car pulled up, we stepped outside. We keep in watch. <laughs> Amen. Ain't that something you'll keep watch on your car, but won't keep watch over your soul. Anyway, verse number 44. So you also must be ready. Mm-hmm. Because the Son of Man will come at an hour when you do not expect him. It's the word of God for us, the people of God. Let us say thanks be to God. All right, yes, we're going to talk about divine surprises. God bless the people of the way, those in person, those in the virtual church. God bless us as we have read your word. May it be a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. And may it make the, the spirit of God that is present among us, around us, and within us, may that spirit arise so the preaching and teaching can be made easy. In Jesus' name we pray. Let the people of God say amen, amen, amen and amen. One of the great gifts of Advent of Christmas is a continuous reminder that God became flesh. The scripture says 
that in Christ, the fullness of the Godhead dwelt bodily. It means that all of the, 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 the essence of God that could uh, be fit into the physical body of a human being without that body being consumed by the divine essence of God, as much as you can stuff in a human body, that's what Jesus was. Jesus was the emptying out of God's eternal existence into a human body, and that body lived and dwelt among us, doing things that continuously pointed the people back to the God of all eternity. This idea that the incarnation happened was not just something that was intended one time. But there is this important kind of principle in our theological assumptions as followers of Jesus that the incarnation never stops happening. That God is always present with us. During this time, you know, we may not appreciate uh, how ingrained the songs of Christmas uh, introduce such deep, rich theological concepts. But the word Emmanuel that we sing, uh, I heard it saying this morning, it means that God is with us. That is not just a Christmas theme. Emmanuel only matters in December. I mean, that, 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 that would be a, a, a bit of a, bit of a, 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 a thief kind of move to, to only say and declare and believe that, that, that God is only with me uh, during the month of December. Because you don't hear folks talking about Emmanuel that much, January, February, March, April, May, June, <laughs> July, August, September. Somebody say amen, right? I mean, how many of y'all be talking about Emmanuel in the summertime? Right? You don't be singing Emmanuel songs in the summertime because it has largely been truncated to one month. But I want you to know that if you were to take a good survey of your daily life, you could be a living, breathing testimony that God is with you. Not in a way that means God isn't with other people, because you know there are some folk out here who believe that God being with me means that God is against you. Anybody ever met those kind of Christians? It seems like the American church produces those kind of Christians a lot. Oh, favor ain't fair. You know, I'm favored from God. It's like, oh, really? What about me? Is there enough for me? <laughs> no, no, no. God being with you is not about you getting extra brownie points. It's not about you escaping the hardship and the difficulties of life. It just means that whatever situation you find yourself in, God is there. And sometimes all we have to do is interact with the God who is always within reach to us. But isn't it just like life to kind of make you and I think God is farther away from us than God actually is? I mean, how many times have you talked yourself into not being a part of the activities where you know it is associated with God because you felt like what you did yesterday or last week or last month means, oh, I, you know, I, I got to get myself together before, you know, I, I you know, I, I do this God thing. That'd be tantamount to you saying, you know what? I know I'm sick. I got a broke leg, but I need to make sure my leg heals before I go to the doctor. Let them do me an x-ray. You would look at someone and be like, man, you got the, you got the thing. <laughs> it's a little mixed up. The sequencing is off. As a matter of fact, the doctor has come for those who are injured. And how many of you know the Savior, the Messiah, the God of all creation has come to be in relationship with all creation regardless of the status of creation? That in many respects, God being with us is an invitation for us to be in relationship with God, to be in conversation with God, to be in commune with God. And if Advent means anything, it means that God is literally in breaking into your life. 
God is now saying, I'm going to make sure that for at least a year, a month out of the year, you won't have to be uh, uh, one of the, 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 the theologians I was trained by. He talked about uh, the anonymous God. There are a lot of people who spend their life, uh, you know, uh, thinking that, that, that God was not present, not knowing that God was always anonymously at work. Man, you attribute it to luck. The theologian said, no, that's called the anonymous God. You attribute it to fate. Oh, no, that's the anonymous God. And then when you get into a relationship with God, you look through your rearview mirror and be like, man, that was God all the time. Don't become so caught up in your own sense of agency and education and finance and relationship and stock that you think God is not there. There will be some moments in your life where you will have an incarnational moment where God will be made flesh in your life. And the Advent is a great time for us to make intentional what often is taken for granted. God, I want to be prepared when you show up. I want to be prepared when you show up. I don't want to have the lock on my door, the lock on the door of my heart, the lock on the door of my mind, the lock on the door of my ears. So you got to literally pick locks in order to get my attention. Now be clear, God's a good lock picking God. God knows how to slide into your life unaware. But, you know, sometimes, you know, I think God would just appreciate a knock and you just open. Like, God, I, I've been waiting for you. <laughs> I, I'm ready to receive everything that you have for me. And so Matthew is speaking with this kind of deep, deep intentionality, trying to uncover, to make sense for the people this idea that Jesus has come. Jesus came intentionally to save us from our sins. And Jesus' return, which we as followers of Christ, we still believe that God will reconcile everything in the end. I mean, I was talking to a friend of mine and I said, you know, one of the great things about, you know, uh, uh, movies, at least 90% of the movies, is they always have a great resolution. Except for, you know, the ones where the hero dies. But usually when the hero dies, they're dying in service to something noble, usually. I mean, there was that one movie, man, where them two folk, they was on a run. What was the, 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 the Black Bonnie and Clyde movie? That? Whew. Yeah, I, I didn't like that movie. I didn't like watching that. That felt too, that felt too unresol un unresolved, praise God. But, you know, 90% of movies, you know, there's this impulse that the plot will end in a resolution that gives us some hope, gives us something to look for. It rewards your watching experience where you feel like, man, I came into this movie and you put me on a roller coaster. But at the end, I left feeling pretty good. Well, I want you to know you ought to think about your life in God's hand the same way. God, I may be on a roller coaster right along through here, but there is a resolution that is about your returning to wrap everything up in a way that gives life to all, in a way that gives healing to all, in a way that brings peace and joy and love. And so the question for you and I as we go through life is how do we prepare ourselves for God's arrival? And that's what Advent is about. In the text, it's so powerful because you find uh, this passage is actually some of the last words Jesus told his disciples on his way to Calvary. On his way to get crucified, Jesus is already preparing them. But guess what? Death will not have the final say. I'm going to die, but guess what? I'm coming back again. I'm going to the cross, but guess what? There's a tomb that's also on the other side of this where it won't be able to hold me down. You may be going through some trials, but guess what? On the other side of the trial, God is saying there is some resolution waiting for you. That you don't have to go into a trial believing that the trial will determine the totality of your life. 
but that at the end of a trial, you can't expect I will be there showing up. Oh, Lord, I don't know. That felt good to me when I, when, I, when I was thinking about all the many times where I thought that my trial would last for longer than it did. Uh, God had a little, you know, uh, you know, I've been cooking a lot more these days, you know, and, 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 and you know, I've had to put the timer on my stove because I'd be forgetting that I'm cooking. You know, you put in some pizza, you boil some water, you know, make some green beans or some, you know, broccoli. I don't know. And, 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 and when I forget that I got broccoli on the stove with some water, if it cooked too long, the broccoli turned to mush. So I got to put a timer. Amen. Because, you know, I could be watching a game, you know, I could be playing, you know, Star Wars on the, on the PlayStation. I could be, you know, beating somebody at Domino's like I did here that Sunday, you know, uh, you know, and, and I just get caught up. So I need a timer. Somebody say amen. To keep me on track so I don't forget that, 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 that this season of cooking has to end eventually. Oh, I want you to know you got a timer in your life called the Holy Ghost. And that timer is tick, 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 tick. It is meant to be a consistent reminder to you that even though you may be going through some hard trials or situations, the situations and the trouble won't last always. And God will make, here's my first point, a holy disruption in your life. Somebody holler, holy disruptions. Verse number 39, it says, and the people knew nothing about what would happen until the flood came and took them all away. This is how it will be at the coming of the Son of Man. I want you to know, child of God, that there's a holy disruption that God brings during Advent to help you appreciate that your schedule needs a little bit of tweaking. You've been going through this year, this month, this season on cruise control. And God is saying, I'm getting ready to do some disrupting in your life. But the disruption is holy. Woo. This disruption is meant to be a holy comma in your life. What's the other thing? Uh, the a anti, no, uh, a semicolon. <laughs> y'all pray for me, amen, y'all. No, I've been sick, so my, my preaching brain is still reconnecting. Amen, amen. You know, it's so important for us to have holy disruptions. Why? Because if the incarnation is still happening, God wants to pause some of us so God can give birth to some things that God has inside of us that could not come forward if you did not slow down. You know, a couple of weeks ago, maybe last week, Dolores Williams, she was a wonderful, powerful woman uh, who, who helped to give birth to what is now called womanist theology. She is an African-American uh, theologian who, who, who was really uh, consumed with this idea that if we're talking about God talk, theology. We can't just talk about it with the centering of Eurocentric uh, men and women and their lives at the center of a God conversation. Because God speaks to more than just Eurocentric men and women. And she, you know, was, was pushing the envelope in the 70s right after James Cone wrote his Black Theology. She was like, I can appreciate the introduction of African American experience, but that's still too male-centered. So what about us sisters? So she wrote a text called Sisters in the Wilderness. Oh, it was a very important text. She died a couple of weeks ago, and so many of us have been reflecting on her work. And I love this quote. I love this quote. It says that faith has taught me to see the miraculous in everyday life. And I, you know, I could just stop right there and preach on that. And I will in a second, but the, the, the rest of it is, is worthy of our attention. That the miracle of ordinary black women resisting and rising above evil forces in society, where forces work to destroy and subvert the creative power and energy that my mother and grandmother taught me God gave black women, that there's a faith, there is a focus, there is materiality 
to the experiences of those who may not always be centered in the study of God's work in the world. But it does not negate that God is at work in your life, even if no one else wants to write about it. Even if no one else wants to talk about it. Even if no one else sees value, God is at work in your life. Lord, have mercy. I want you to know, child of God, that, that I, I like to refer to Dolores Williams as, as, a, as, a, as a, a theotokos, if you will, uh, with a small t. A theotokos is the word that is ascribed to the Virgin Mary. Uh, as she gave birth to Jesus, she was called a theotokos with a big T because she gave birth to the divine, if you will. I want you to know that God is saying that some of us, if not all of us, have the capacity to be a theotokos with a small t. That a holy disruption is important because there is something inside of you that God wants to give birth to in this season when God disrupts your life. God don't want you to feel like, oh, I'm sick. And so uh, there's no purpose that can be extracted from the season of sickness. No, God is saying even while you're sick, God says I can give birth to something new. Oh, my relationships are changing and, and, and my, 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 my children, my, my partner, my, my job, all of it's upside down. Oh, so woe is me. God is saying, no, child of God, even in this holy disruption, there's something new that I have the capacity to bring forward regardless of the circumstance and the situation. And that is why it's so important for you to appreciate that in this season of Advent, God says, you won't know when I'm coming, but when I come, I'm going to disrupt some things. Because my coming, it makes, it should make sense. The coming of God in your life should not leave your life the same. Unless you just don't think God is that disruptive. <laughs> Somebody say amen. I mean, God, you talking about like God? Yes, the creator of the universe. Be wanting to poke God's head into your life to make sure you get a little bit of a pause or a comma. Sometimes a period. <laughs> like, oh, this is over. Somebody say amen. <laughs> How many of you are glad God put a period in some situations in your life? If God didn't take you out of it, you'd still be in there lingering. But God wants you to see, child of God, that there is a faith that has taught you to see the miraculous in your everyday life. That's why God needs to put a pause in some of our lives. Living here in the Bay Area, boy, we'll be so busy we won't see nothing miraculous. Well, you go, you wake up, go work out. Help me, Lord. Uh, you drop your kids to school. You go to work. You take a 10-minute lunch because you can't be away from your work that long. Then you go back to work. Then you pick up your kids. You go home, order DoorDash. Or, or overcook some broccoli. <laughs> you get an hour of some bad TV in. And then what? You on your way to bed and tomorrow you up at the same time. Meanwhile, you're riding through the most beautiful part of the country. You don't take time to look at the water, to look at the mountains, to look at the skyline. Why? Because you are too busy. God says, I got to put a holy disruption in your life. Because you're missing out on the miraculous of every day life. Oh, so here's, here's one of the questions. How does Jesus' arrival interrupt your currently scheduled programming? We in Advent, you ought to have some holy disruptions right along through here. What everyday miracle are you missing out on by not birthing the incarnational work that God is stirring within you? There's a business in somebody in here. Somebody say, birth it, Lord. There's, a, there, there, there's a, a new vocation in here. Somebody say, birth it, Lord. There's a new relationship in here. Somebody say, birth it, Lord. There's a new idea. Somebody say, birth it, Lord. There's a new opportunity. There's some new knowledge and new wisdom. Birth it, Lord. Don't let the advent only be uh, so, so, so uh, outward facing that it robs you of the opportunity for God to birth something inside of you. 
for God to give and bring forward something that could bless the masses, something that could bless your family, something that could bless so many. My prayer for us is birth it, Lord. The second thing that the text reads is one of the hard sayings. It talks about that this season also sometimes requires a sacred separation. Yes, I, 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 when I, that's, that's how all of us react. Verse number 40, verse 41, this is how it will be in the coming of the Son of Man. Two will be in the field. One will be taken. The other will be left. For all you who worried about gender equality, two women will be grinding with a hand mill. <laughs> One will be taken and the other left. Does God's arrival Signal the end of something old as you prepare for something new. Now, I, 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 I want to be verbose on this point because this is a hard saying. Because for many of us, we don't do life transitions very well. Whether they are forced upon us or whether they are unin. Uh, uh, unintentional or things beyond our control. But the text says that this is how it will be. Suddenly you will be in a place with your comrade, with your boo, your partner, your job, and one will be taken and the other will be left. The first question I ask is, God, am I the one taken? <laughs> or am I the one left? <laughs> you know what I heard the Lord just kind of whisper to me? It depends. <laughs> Hello, somebody. How many know if you be honest, sometimes God will take you out of a thing, but sometimes God will take that thing away from you. But either way, you got to trust the providence of God that there are moments and seasons where sacred separation is necessary. How do you process the transitions when people leave you through tragic circumstances of death? And we have experienced that in COVID. We're still in COVID. <laughs> I know we one of the few folk that's still talking about wearing masks, but we gonna talk about it until we out of COVID. The, 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 the data is saying that I think it's 12 million folk in this country are dealing with long COVID. We still have uh, infections. We got, we got variants. We got all kinds of things. Now, you know, the anti-COVID folks are saying that it don't matter if you're vaccinated because only the vaccinated are getting COVID. And I was like, Lord, if you people won't just go away, <laughs> keep your lack of science to yourself. Because everybody who talk about what they are convinced about change their mind when they get too sick to care for themselves. You'll get sick enough in all your YouTube videos. I hope I'm stepping on somebody's toes if that's you. We'll go away and you'll be at Kaiser Summit, Alta Bates, asking for the same doc that you was trivializing last week to give you some treatment. And you'll ask for it for free. And we'll all have to pay for it. But we will. Because we Christian people, somebody say that. And we want everybody to get the health care they need. I want it, but I, I would. If I, I'd be giving you, now you know. How many of you know that the process of transitions can leave grief? It can be a stamp of dissonance. But sometimes it's so important to appreciate that some of this separation you need it. I often ask myself, particularly as I look at the way in which Christian faith in our country gets so attached to the, to the radicals who are, who are trying to literally dismantle uh, what functional elements of this country still exist. 
Because it's important to say that, you know, for a lot of us, we've been experiencing a fascist-like government for a long time. Arbitrary violence being visited upon us. It don't just have to be physical violence. Martin Luther King III's uh, 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 wife, Coretta Scott King, said poverty is violence. Low funding in schools is violence. Bad housing or no housing is violence. So, you know, some of us, you know, we've been dealing with a a month to month, year to year expression of state violence. But how do we marry our theological conversations and beliefs about God with so much violence in the world? But for the grace of God, you and I could not coexist with some of this stuff that God's arrival is coming to interrupt. I need God to take away my sensibilities around around, uh, prejudice and bias. I need God to separate uh, the despise I have for the poor and the unhoused. I need God to separate the homophobia, the transphobia, the kinds of phobias that cause me not to love my neighbor uh, at every point of their life. I need God to separate the kind of racism and xenophobia and hierarchy that makes me comfortable with others people's lives being destroyed so my hope is God if you gotta take me away from some of these ideologies that keep me not loving my neighbor well take me away and God if you need to move some people out of my life so I'm left there by myself because I'm just too attached to get away from them then God please move some folk Give some folks some pink slips if I don't have the courage to give it to them myself. God, help me to appreciate that I do not need to stay in a place when your coming is coming to make some separation. I'm not telling you, you know, my my daughter, you know, we was talking about, you know, school kids, so much drama. And I I didn't, you know, I was a youth pastor for so many years, but it, it, it hit different when they in your house. Praise God, because, you know, I deal with them, you know, then be like, well, God bless your mom and your dad. I hope, you know, just call me if you need me. Praise God. And then, you know, they in my house. Praise God. And, you know, they talking about all the drama little kids have. You know, she told me the other day, you know, I had to cut them off. I said, cut them off. I said, you're too young to cut people off. No, I just had to cut them off. I said, like, y'all, you know, y'all using that language? Like, I'm cutting you off? I was like, I mean, why don't y'all just not be friends? Well, that's what we call it. We call it cutting them off. <laughs> Say, man, I feel like you too, you too young to learn how to cut people off at 13 years old. Maybe not. I don't know. So I know a lot of us, you know, we feel like we got to, you know, keep toxic people in our lives. But sometimes, you know, you know, you know, the separation don't have to be like a total separation. It can just be some distance. You know, some folk call those boundaries. <laughs> Hello, somebody. Put a little boundary, man, where, you know, you, I'm right here. You right there. And no matter how much you try to touch me, <laughs> You ain't going to reach me, but I, I'm there. I'm just not that close. How many know sometimes a holy separation is about a holy boundary? God wants to put some boundaries. Why? So you can be clear about how God's arrival is trying to do something new in your life. Do something new in our lives. How does God's arrival Signal the new thing over and against the old thing. And what sensibilities is God trying to help you to distance from? I want to be away, far away from those things that are giving me the wrong information. That are causing me to forget that God is with me. I mean, I've asked some of my evangelical friends, what must you believe about God? For you to think that God hates so many people except you. I mean, that's a small God. That is called an idol. And we all ought to be concerned about our idols. Hello, somebody. 
Because for many of us, I know it's true for me, it's easier for me to pick out your idol and not see my own. So God, separate me from my idols. Those things that I devote my loyalty to, that literally, oh my, the time is going to dumb down your arrival. And then the last thing, we're going to spend the next few weeks preaching on these things, the divine surprise. You must be ready. Why? Because the Son of Man will come at an hour when you do not expect. Woo! Old saints used to say, he may not come when you want him. But he's right on time. You can't hurry, God. You just have to wait. You got to trust him and give him more time. No matter how long it takes. So this is the Daisy. She know that. He's a God. You can't hurry. He'll be there. So don't you worry. He may not come when you want him. But he's right on time. Come on, stand to your feet. Help us sing that one more time. You say, you can't hurry, God. You just have to wait. You just have to wait. You gotta trust him and give him more time. No matter how long it takes. He's a God and you can't hurry. He'll be there. So don't you worry. He may not come when you want him. Then they say it again. Oh, he may not come when you want him. That's a good old song. He may not come when you want him, but he's right on time. Give God a hand praise if you know God is on time. The on time God knows how to surprise you at the moment you need God the most. Jesus breaking into your life is about you experiencing a divine surprise. And this whole Advent season, we're going to talk about hope. Why? Because hope should be your motivation that things are going to get better and be resolved. Peace should be the stabilizing force in your life because you know that there's something beyond your circumstance that could be a compass for you. Love is a force. It's not just a feeling or an emotion, it's a force. And joy is your fuel. Faith is your foundation. With these truths by your side, you can be convinced that God will always be there right on time. God, we want to say thank you for the word of God. Thank you for the words that we have read, the preaching that we have heard. I pray, God, that as we move through this season of Advent, God, we will be open to a divine surprise that comes from you. God, I pray that you will literally break into our lives and give us a holy disruption that reminds us, God, that you want to give birth to some things in us. That faith is the ability, oh God, to see the miraculous in our daily lives. Lord, I pray that you will help us to, Lord God, see you at work in our life, putting pauses and commas and periods and semicolons so you can do some working in us. God, I pray that whatever needs to be separated from us in this season, whatever kind of things or, or thoughts, oh God, or stimuli, I pray, God, that if one will be taken and the other left, I pray, God, that whatever you're taking, God, will release it. And whatever God is remaining, I pray, God, that we, oh God, will see your providence at work as well. Open us up to a divine surprise that we may be prepared for your arrival. And we'll say thank you, God, for your coming that never ceases. Show up in our lives this week. In Jesus' name we pray. Come on and give God a hand praise. Give God a hand praise.
God bless you people of the way. Listen, let's do some work this Advent season and prepare ourselves for God's arrival. Amen. Let's 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 pass on some opportunities to break into some folks' lives. We're talking about these these cards to our incarcerated loved ones. You'll be surprised how a letter forged with faith and possibility can interrupt some people's despair. You'll be surprised how you just being open to being a vessel for God to flow through in this season will open up some space for God to meet you as well. My hope is that we will be surprised by God in the name of the Lord. Amen. All right. Go with God. Have a wonderful, wonderful week, a wonderful, wonderful day. We'll see you next week, next Sunday in the name of the Lord. God bless you, people of the way.